It's a pleasure to be introducing Barry Smith from the University of Buffalo, who is very well known in the ontology community, hardly needs an introduction to any of us. Um, so you're running the National Center of Ontology Research, NCOR. So you're, you're in charge of the entire field, aren't you? Well, I do my best. Thank you very much. Some of you, I'm sure, know a lot more than I do about the background of ontology work in industry and engineering. This is just a random selection of four papers that I found from the early period of ontology for engineering. And the, if you look at them, again, this is just a random sample, you'll find that they're characterized by the fact that they all start again from the beginning. So they don't to rely on already existing work. They each use a different methodology. They use different terms. And uh, the, the, the cumulative effect of hundreds of papers like this, addressing the same problem in, in an ad hoc way um, without concerning uh, itself with common principles, is one of the reasons why in the engineering field, ontology has had such a bad reputation. Uh, so people do not trust the idea of ontologies very much in industry because there is really no accumulation of established content or of established principles. And um, so the, the, this is not unique to engineering, of course. Uh, other fields have witnessed the same kind of surfeit of too many ontologies built on the basis of ad hoc methods which didn't... Uh, managed to get accepted by a large enough community to create a critical mass of users. And the consequence in the industrial world is that there are, as far as I can tell, no real world examples of industrial use, at least none that can be pointed to as success stories demonstrating the advantages of ontology. On the other hand, the, the problems which ontology is designed to address particularly problems of failures of interoperability are rampant in the engineering world and they are causing all kinds of breakdowns of otherwise exciting visions and possibilities. And um, so I, I think it's necessary that we start again, that we try and work out how we can make a good case for the use of ontology in the engineering field. And um, so most of you, I think, will know that I did my original work in ontology in the field of biomedicine, and I'm still working in the field of biomedicine, and I'm still an advocate of the gene ontology as our principal model and paradigm of good practice in ontology. And it seems that if you look at the statistics pertaining to the references to the gene ontology, in PubMed abstracts, which continue to rise, at least until very recently, then it seems that other people agree that the gene ontology is doing something right. Now, the gene ontology itself consists of three sub-ontologies for biological processes, molecular functions, and cellular components. And um, there are, or there was a need for ontologies covering other things. So cell types or cell parts or proteins. These were areas of the life sciences which did not have any coverage in the gene ontology. And so people developed ontologies to cover these areas which were orthogonal to the gene ontology. And then the question arose, how can you ensure that the ontologies developed in this way orthogonally to the gene ontology will still work successfully with the already established body of data which has been annotated with the gene ontology itself. And to solve that problem, we created something called the OBO Foundry, which was a principles-based initiative for the creation of ontologies in a coordinated fashion so that the ontologies would be networked together they would not overlap, there would be no, no redundancy, and they would be consistent with each other. And uh, so this is the original um, drawing of how the Oboe Foundry ontologies should relate to each other. 
it's it's grown somewhat larger since then. This is a, a, a snapshot of some of the ontologies which are available, all of which satisfy the same uh, principles as were outlined for the original Oboe Foundry. And the principles look like this. So there's a principle of commitment to collaborate, open access, using OWL and a little bit now common logic. They have to be updated consistently. They have a common architecture. They, uh, they follow simple traffic laws such as that all the terms in all the ontologies have to be singular common nouns. That doesn't quite work in chemistry, but it works everywhere else. There has to be a help desk and a, uh, there has to be someone responsible. All terms have to have definitions and then there should be one ontology for each domain. So not two protein ontologies, but just one protein ontology. So just to go over the ground with regard to principle number eight, when we give terms definitions, we are required to use terms in those definitions which are drawn from other oboe foundry ontologies. So when we define elevated blood glucose concentration, for instance, then we are required to define that complex term by using simpler terms drawn from other oboe foundry or candidate oboe foundry ontologies. And that creates a network effect. All the ontologies become bonded together through the fact that their definitions are compulsorily constrained to reuse terms from the other ontologies within the same suite. And then orthogonality, this is catered for in two steps. First of all, uh, we created something called the Oboe Library. And then the Oboe Library grew and grew and grew, and we realized that there was a need to create a subset of the ontologies in the Oboe Library, which would satisfy the principles I just mentioned, and other principles in due course. And then we committed to maintaining the Oboe Foundry ontologies as reference ontologies so that they would always be up to date. And for this purpose, we used a hub and spokes strategy so that the hub is BFO, and then there are spokes, including the gene ontology, and then there are spokes of spokes. So the cell cycle ontology, for instance, is a spoke connecting to the hub, which is the cell ontology, which in turn is connected to the central hub, which is BFO. And this is how it looks like from a slightly different angle. And the idea was then extended to other domains. So there is now a plant oboe foundry called CROP, which is part of the Plantium project, which is a, an agricultural genomics and plant science project. The United Nations is using a similar approach, again, based on BFO and so on. So this idea has been found very useful when people have a large a range of data for which they need a large amount of ontology coverage, but whether ontologies should be consistent with each other and developed on the basis of common principles. The idea is that those common principles or a set of common principles, since it's not the only way to do this, are encapsulated in BFO. And um, the Industry Ontologies Foundry was then created by taking the oboe foundry principles, or at least taking similar principles, and trying to do the same thing for the field of industry, particularly manufacturing industry. Now, at the moment, the Industry Ontologies Foundry is a very um, tentative experiment. So we are still working on a charter. We have, an, as you will see, a number of interesting collaborators, all of whom are committed to the idea of the Industry Ontologies Foundry, but we have not got very far. So we, we don't have a single ontology which has been somehow approved as being conformant to the IOF principles. And the IOF principles have not been laid down in a way which we all agree to, but we do agree with a number of things which are recognizably in the spirit of the Oboe Foundry, including the name. Now, BFO it was, was chosen as the hub for the Oboe Foundry in part because the BFO has been reused so many different times. 
not just in biology and medicine ontologies, but now in many other sorts of ontologies. So there is a list of um, ontologies which are reusing VFO at the web address here. And it's increasingly being used also in suites of ontologies of the sort which I described, including some of them which are not in the public domain. So BFO is in the public domain, and there are all of the ontologies listed here are in the public domain, but now there are other, in some ways, very influential ontologies which are not in the public domain. We also have a textbook which describes how to build ontologies using BFO. And... Um, uh, and now, on that basis, uh, the Industry Ontologies Foundry Initiative was established in late 2016, so not very long ago. And the goal, again, is to create a suite of interoperable ontologies, reference ontologies, covering the domain of industrial engineering. Now, we have a number of government partners. Um, NIST is, of course, the most important partner, and they've been helping a lot with the, uh, uh, the logistics of putting together something, an effort along these lines. We also have support from the Air Force Research Lab. We are in a, a state of pre-negotiation with two other organizations, um, or actually two other collaborations. One is the Air Force Material Command, and the other is the Jet Propulsion Lab, which is working with NASA and DOD and some other agencies to build an ontology suite for systems engineering. Um, it's not yet been decided whether the, this ontology suite will be part of the I.O. Uh, foundry or will, will work in tandem with the I.O. foundry, but certainly there are negotiations which make both of those opportunities possible. And if any of you are interested in being part of any of these efforts that I mentioned, then I can put you in touch with the persons responsible, if, if you wish. Then we have some industry collaborators who've been attending the meetings and helping in a number of ways. And they are listed here. Steve Ray is listed here as a, an, an industrial collaborator, but of course he is also a human being. And Kubrick is listed as an industrial collaborator. Kubrick is a research company, a uh, non-for-profit uh, company in Buffalo, which is um, related to the university here and which um, is a place where faculty members do uh, non-academic research. And they have been very much involved in the background work on IOF. And then we have some companies, uh, sorry, we have some uh, academic uh, organizations, um, including several universities. We have NCOR, uh, we have the um, Federal Polytechnic in Lausanne, where, where one of the founders of the OBO Foundry is, uh, of the IO Foundry uh, is, is um, residing. And we also have the University of Toulouse, where Hedy Carré works, and Hedy Carré actually gave the, the IO Foundry its name. So he was the person who suggested that we take the model of the OBO Foundry and apply it in the area of industry, uh, which was the area which he was working in. He came to Buffalo for a sabbatical and, uh, and uh, pointed, this, it pointed the Buffalo people who are listed uh, lower down here in the right direction. And since then, we've been collaborating with other universities um, who have already been doing work very much in the spirit of the Industry Ontologies Foundry, but without the architecture of an actual initiative to create coordinated ontologies. So we had a kickoff meeting in December. Uh, you can find a blog uh, entry there which is reporting on the results of that meeting. And then we had the second workshop, which was in April. And um, uh, that was a two-day workshop with a, a number of industrial implementations described. And, um, and we, we have started in implementing the move from an, an OBO library type structure to an OBO foundry type structure by creating the library. So we have a portal called the Industrial Engineering Ontologies Portal, which was created by uh, applying the NCBO Virtual App 
uh, for people to upload their industry ontologies. And if you have industry ontologies to upload, you should upload them immediately. The idea is that we will then, at some stage when we have all agreed on our principles, select candidate ontologies from this longer list and uh, deem that these ontologies are I.O. foundry ontologies. And we have to work out the process of peer review which will make that possible. So that's, that's the method which we applied in the OVO foundry case which seemed to work well. It took much longer than we all thought uh, to, to get the OVO foundry really working but it seems to work very well and, and it, it, it has many many people who are using the ontologies which were created within the OVO foundry framework. So this is the, uh, the uh, opening the index page for the IE portal and this is just an, a sample. There are something like 30 odd ontologies listed including a service management ontology and an industrial maintenance management ontology. And now there are various test beds. Uh, these are test beds which I am primarily involved in. There are other test beds which other people are primarily involved in. I'm going to talk about these because I know most about these. I'm pretty confident that some of all four of these test beds will survive into the EIO foundry itself. But anyway, you can see from these test beds the sort of ontology development work which is taking place. So we'll start with a project uh, funded by DIMDI, which is a government project to support digital manuf manufacturing. Uh, part of the background of this project was something called the Materials Genome Initiative, which was an attempt by uh, President Obama to apply in the area of material science the powerful informatics methods and tools uh, which had proven successful in the area of biology with the uh, decoding of the human genome. So he wanted to create some kind of a decoding of a materials genome to create, invent, discover new materials which could be used, for instance, in nanotechnology and other areas of manufacturing. The other part of the background of DIMD is what is called the model-based definition. And the model-based definition, as we shall see, is only a partial solution to the problem of AI in manufacturing or digital manufacturing, uh, but it's an important part and it's a successful part. So the model-based definition is based on CAD technology. The idea is that CAD technology shows us how we can use digital resources in order to do manufacturing. But CAD technology covers primarily just shape, shape, topology, connection, it doesn't, doesn't cover things like the behavior of a manufactured product. It doesn't cover the materials that the manufactured product uses. It doesn't cover the economics of the manufactured product. It doesn't cover the product life cycle. It doesn't cover use. It just covers the geometry. And so the idea of the DIMD call, which uh, led to the funding of the Buffalo Champ grant, which I will describe in a minute, was to try and fill in some of these gaps, to complete the model-based definition so that it would apply also to materials or to the product life cycle. Now, this never worked. No one ever succeeded in completing the model-based definition. And whether we succeed or not is, remains to be seen, but we will certainly only succeed in part because it's a, such an immensely complicated problem. The reason why no one succeeded is because while there is a relatively stable core of CAD software tools, the, there is no correspondingly stable core of digital resources which can be used to manage product lifecycle or materials or behavior of products or use of products and all of those other things, faults, maintenance, uh, disposal, um, and so forth. Every company has a tendency to develop, to develop its own tools because they want to control the tools that they use because they know that their own technology will change and that they will have new clients and new vendors 
whose technology will also be changing. And to keep these various changing technological modules in sync with each other is, practically speaking, impossible. And this is the core of our DIMDI initiative in Buffalo. So the, the, the acronym is CHAMP, which stands for Coordinated, well, you can read it here. And the goal of CHAMP was to create a suite of small open ontologies to cover the domain of manufacturing engineering, which would be something like a counterpart of the robust and well accepted CAD software tools. But instead of being software tools, they would be ontologies. They would provide a small step towards interoperability and a small step towards conservative change or lack of change, a small set towards stability by fixing reference terminologies in an ontologically uh, well-conceived fashion so that people who want to build software to deal with behavior or materials or product use and so forth will at least have a common starting point in the terminological level which will be shared by other people. And that just doesn't just mean a controlled vocabulary, it also means definitions, it means reasoning, it means consistency checking, and so forth. And in Buffalo, we have tools which can apply ontologies to data in ways which would allow us to test the utility of this kind of suite of interoperable ontologies. So we have a tool called OSCAR which is an extension of a, another tool, which is a public domain tool called Karma, which anyone can use. Oscar is just better than Karma. And what Oscar does is it allows you to, to tag, in a rather sophisticated way, many, many different data bases, uh, data resources, built in many different ways, in such a way as to produce a gigantic RDF graph, basically. Um, and these can be data about products, parts, capabilities, failures, and so on. They can be data about anything. Now, the fact that people have so much data, which changes so rapidly, and which, which comes from third parties such as vendors and suppliers, which have their own ways of describing it, means that it's very hard to answer simple questions. So, um, you have a complex artifact with parts which you purchase from other suppliers and your your complex artifact is failing at a certain rate which of the failures is being contributed by your vendor supplied parts that is a question which every manufacturer wants the answer to it's very difficult to find the answer because the relevant data is non interoperable in the relevant sense you can't create a history of the product, even if you have the product life cycle from the vendor, because the product life cycle from the vendor will be flavored in such a different way that the data will not be combinable. And then similarly, how can we make the product more cheaply in either time or money while preserving quality? You can't ask questions like that on the basis of the data that you have at the moment because the data is so massively heterogeneous. Now, big companies, of course, try and solve this problem by creating their own software suites. Um, they pay consultants, uh, companies to build custom systems. But the, even those custom sim systems don't work because every big company has vendors. They have suppliers who use different systems. And so, again, you have a breakdown of data interoperability. Small companies are in an even worse situation because they can't afford uh, large, um, even internally managed, consistent software suites. And so they have to buy off the shelf and then the off the shelf products that they buy do not work well with each other, in part because they all use different terminology. So this, this is the, the um, challenge that we were facing with CHAMP. We work, we're working with a, uh, an industrial company called Cobham Industries. We have tools 
We have a way of building ontologies. We're going to build ontologies to enable the data of Cobham to be managed using karma in such a way that we can convert large numbers of databases into gigantic RDF graphs, which we can then use for analysis purposes. And we are already making small steps towards being able to do that. Um, so we have the basic formal ontology. We also have the common core ontologies, which are a set of uh, reference ontologies created by Kubrick for purposes like this. And we are building now the product lifecycle ontology, which I'll talk about at length. The materials ontology, which is being built by Buffalo, collaborating with uh, UMass Amherst and um, Texas State University and the, the European Biomedical Institute, uh, it, it, European Bioinformatics Institute, EBI, which created a chemistry ontology called CHEBI or KEBI, and which is being used as part of our materials ontology to deal with polymers. And then we have other ontologies uh, on this picture. So the goal is to create ontologies covering roughly this ground. And um, so one example of a question, uh, how do the parts supplied by suppliers affect the testing outcomes of assembled product products? Now we have an even more complicated database interoperability challenge because we need not merely the data pertaining to the parts, both as designed and as actually delivered. We, we, we have the data pertaining to the origins of those parts, the suppliers, the date, the batch. We have data pertaining to the um, assembled products, how they behave under different circumstances. And then we have data pertaining to tests supplied to the assembled products and also data pertaining to the results of those tests. Unfortunately, we have a quite sophisticated testing and, and data uh, measurement measurement data ontology, which is we, we, we can um, import from our biomedical work. That's the ontology for biomedical investigations. And if we import that, then we have a, a, a very, very rough ontology framework here. There are actually only three ontology terms that you can see, the green ones. Everything else is a designation of the name of some specific thing an act, an organization, a datum, a design specification, and so on. These are things which are then instances of terms in one or other of our ontologies, and you can see three such terms here. All right, so this is the first step. We have all of the data. Um, we have the IDs for the artifacts down the left, we have the kind of device, we have the serial numbers of the device, we have and then information about testing, serial numbers, radiographic examination, since this is an x-ray test, outputs of radiographic uh, um, examination such as results, and so on. So this is just a small fraction of relevant data. And at the top, you can see the beginnings of our work to tag these data using terms from ontologies. This, this is done within the uh, dashboard provided by Karma. And you can see one example towards the right where we're actually creating not just a tag, which is a simple one-to-one -one link between an ontology term and a column header within a database, but also an actual statement uh, where more than one column headers are linked together by a certain relation. Now, let's see how this works in the, um, uh, the actual case that we were uh, asking about, namely, how do the parts supplied by suppliers affect testing outcomes of assembled product products? We have organization one, which produces product one, um, which uses product two, which is produced by organization two. Now, using karma and using the data which has been tagged with, with ontology terms, we can 
focus our query on just those parts which are produced by organizations other than organization number one, which is Cobham. Cobham is using products made by organizations number two to N. We can focus on those products. We can then focus further down on those products which are actually used in product number one because each of those organizations will, of course, make many other products, and so on. And then we can focus on test results relating to those products produced by external organizations which are used in product one. And the, we can identify then exactly which line of data corresponds to, sorry, which lines of data corresponds to testing results for products meeting those criteria. And then we can link those, and we haven't reached that point yet, and I'm not going to show it today, by using our product lifecycle ontology to the outcomes of installing them within the product one, which is under inspection. And in that way, we hope we will be able to identify which of the products two to N are responsible for bringing about which behaviors both good behaviors and bad behaviors in product one. Uh, this is another similar uh, screen showing an ontology which has been used to uh, analyze specific test results. So we have an inflation device which has cracks in it. We want to be able to identify the cracks, so we use x-ray testing. And what you see in the background is an ontology of which enables data about x-ray testing, including data about cracks and bubbles and so forth, to be used within the Karma dashboard in order to tag the testing data, which is coming out of the Cobham testing lab. Um, you've seen that already. Uh, this is a, just a slightly wider uh, and more visible readout of the radiographic data as it appears when you're using the Karma dashboard. And um, this is how it looks when you have not just the lowest level, but you allow the whole thing to populate upwards to higher levels within the ontology. And it's at that point where you can start to do analysis and ask more interesting questions, for instance, about which part led to this particular radiographic test, which, what role is played by that part within the assembled complex part, product one, and so forth. Um, we can, so we can already do this kind of thing. We can return the, a list which gives the 25 products created by Cobham which have the longest period when they didn't need to be maintained. And to do that, we need to have RDF triples which look like the ones listed here. Okay, that's the, um, the, the first and the, the most detailed test bed. The second one goes very quickly, so in connection with the Materials Genome Initiative, uh, there was an AFRL managed ontology called Matonto created. This ontology was not very good, and it was replaced by a tool, which is a kind of protege for ontology suites, which looks to be very promising. And we have now been commissioned to create within the framework of IOF and DIMD a new version of Martonto, which will replace the original version, which was, as I say, not very good. And we're doing this collaboratively. So I've already mentioned we're working with Kebi. We're also working with two groups who are building ontologies for specific kinds of materials. And the idea is that we find similar groups who are working on ontologies for other kinds of materials and we press all of these groups to build their ontologies in such a way that they join together. We have joined up ontology within the spirit of the IO foundry principles. And the third test bed is basic formal ontology. Is basic formal ontology the appropriate top level ontology for the IO foundry? This is the continuant part. This is the occurrent part of BFO. And all we need for the moment is to distinguish between two kinds of dependent continuance. Continuance are either material entities such as rabbits or planets, 
or they are attributes such as qualities or dispositions. And we distinguish between two kinds of dependence relation. Attributes such as qualities specifically depend upon their bearers, which means that they can exist only in a given specific bearer. Then we also have generically dependent con uh, attributes or the generically dependent continuance, as we call them, which can be copied from one bearer to another. And an example of such a generically dependent continuance would be any file on any computer, which can be copied from one computer to another. The file is the information entity, the hard drive is the bearer. And we will need that in order to move on to the final test bed, which is the product life cycle ontology. And um, we start with the generically dependent continuance because information entities are going to be a crucial component in our product life cycle. If we redraw the top level organization of BFO, we have material entities, attributes and information entities on the one hand, and then we have processes on the other hand. So BFO divides everything into either a continuant or an occurrent. And um, we're going to focus just on these three to save time. And uh, we're going to give some examples. So a switch is a material entity, a boiler is a material entity, a CAD model is an information entity, a maintenance plan is an information entity, a design process is a process, an end of life is process is a process, and so on. This is certainly not rocket science. All right, now we put them vertically, and we add time across the top of the screen, and we remind ourselves that all material entities are occupying spatial regions, all processes are occupying temporal regions, and then we note that the product life cycle is a process. It's actually a planned process. We need to distinguish between the product life cycle as a planned process and what actually happens in a given factory. But we will talk today only about planned processes. The product life cycle process includes various parts. The design process, the production plan generation process, the production process, and so on. And this is a parthood structure and also a temporal structure and also and is a hierarchy. So the production process is a part of the product life cycle, but it stands in an is a relation to the BFO category of processes. So that's how that looks. And there are, so each industry will have slightly different names for these things and we'll slice them at slightly different points. And that is the goal of the IO foundry. Where we have generic representations of the PLC, we're going to have to find a way to map them coherently to the IOF product life cycle ontology, of which this is really just a, a, a first draft. We need to have a product life cycle ontology which can serve as an attractor for all the existing product life cycle partitions which are being used by all of the different organizations participating in the manufacturing industry. It's going to be very useful if we can succeed in doing it, but it's not going to be easy. And at the beginning, we're only going to be able to succeed with a, n a small number of companies who have already felt the pain more urgently than others. Okay, now we have in addition to processes also information entities such as production plans. A production plan is the output of a production plan generation process and it guides the production process. And it has an output which is a material entity called a product. This is for product life cycles where the product is material. We would need a modified product life cycle ontology for those products which are, for instance, digital. Uh, now the maintenance plan generation process, which is part of the product life cycle, has a maintenance plan as an output and it guides the maintenance process. So this picture now looks like this. And you see we have two information artifacts here, production plan and the maintenance plan. And typically 
there will be a maintenance report, which is also part of the product life cycle, which is also an information entity, which is also the output of the maintenance process. And the product is the output, output of the production process, which is guided by the production plan and so on. So we have a lot of guided by and output here. Only one material entity so far. This is more information entity, so we have a requirement specification guiding a design process which has an output, a product model, and so on. And then we have a technical manual which is part of what guides the activities of the maintenance personnel, which is another information artifact. And now we see more about material entities, so products are created out of raw materials, at least when they're made of material, and they get transformed into waste material, uh, or they get recycled into new products. And now we see more material entities, so raw material, waste material, human beings such as maintenance engineers, factories, utilities, roads, transport systems, water, and so on, data, uh, data systems, I guess. And now we have Another picture of how the, how the ontologies will look that we're trying to build as part of our test bed for the IOF. And I believe that that is the final slide. So here again is the URL if you want to look over the slides. And Dimitris Kiritsis in Lausanne was uh, very much responsible for the product lifecycle ontology work. Neil Ott is the manager of the DIMDI project and, and, and has also been responsible for a lot of this work. And Robert Nicky is the head of the ontology team at Kubrick, which was responsible for the Common Core ontologies and many of the extension ontologies which we're using on a daily basis. And that, I believe, is the end. Thank you, Barry. It seemed as you were discussing this, uh, this these areas where they have varying uh, products that define uh, some of the digital things differently. It reminded me very much of the healthcare scene. Oh, absolutely. And, uh, and this approach will also apply there and vice versa. Well, we have been working hard to bring about similar effects in the world of medicine and, and uh, electronic health records. In, in biology, we had great success. The gene ontology really does bring about the situation where there is a huge amount of interoperability across different disciplines, different organizations, different countries, um, and so forth. If you try and do the same thing in medicine, it's much harder because there are problems of, of, of um, liability, for instance. There are also very powerful, influential companies who have um, persuaded the government that they should be able to do things separately. Um, and so it's much harder in medicine, but we have a number of uh, groups who are friendlily disposed towards this kind of approach in medicine also, and particularly in Europe, where there is a greater degree of um, government influence on standards within the medical IT world.